From Blackfoot to Teton, we've got your District 6 breakdown right here on the East Idaho PrepCast with Lance Taylor. That's right. It's another edition of the East Idaho PrepCast on IdahoSports.com, breaking down everything going on in District 6 Athletics. Brandon Bainey with Lance Taylor. It's brought to you by Pure Adrenaline Motorsports. You see the logo up in the top uh, right-hand corner. If you're watching the video of this on the IdahoSports.com YouTube channel or Facebook page, you can also see the logo uh, on the uh, middle of the top of the uh, awesome sunglasses that Lance is showing off. Uh, and if you're listening to the audio only version of this uh, prep cast on IdahoSports.com or wherever you download your podcasts, I will tell you that Pure Adrenaline Motorsports is your source for pulse pounding adrenaline sports apparel and accessories that ensure you have what you need to unleash your inner beast. Lance, how are you? I'm doing excellent. Doing excellent. I'm pumped about tonight. Yes. Okay. So little behind the scenes here. We're recording this on Thursday morning. And, of course, Thursday night, tonight, uh, game night inside Holt Arena as Sugar Salem will take on Marsh Valley in a 3A quarterfinal matchup. Lance and I will be on the call on IdahoSports.com. So maybe by the time you're listening to this, the game has already happened. And uh, when we make our predictions later, just remember that uh, we try to be as smart as we can. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh i don't know smart's the word to use it's uh we try to act smart uh no we try you know we try to be as fair as we can be we try to do what we feel is is the fair assessment yes uh, but you know what brandon all this time we've known each other we've never done a game together i, I know am it's really excited and since we're on on audio only uh you know, I'll be sporting a nice bikini, you know, <laughs> that I come in there with. And I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Well, <laughs> <a nice> bikini. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you, Lance, as somebody who was inside Holt Arena last week a lot for all these other playoff games, uh, a bikini isn't too far off because they keep it nice and toasty in there. You know, you got yeah, to you got to climb up all those stairs to get to the broadcast booth. And then it's like 80 degrees in, in inside there too. I was sweating pretty bad. Well, it, it is. It tends to get that way. Now I remember it back in the eighties when it was of course called the mini dome back in the eighties and, uh, and uh, the university rented it from the city and they had a, a, a problem with the heating bill. And uh, so the city turned the heat off. So the Idaho state basketball players, when they put the court down in there, that was when they used to play in Holt arena. Uh, as well, they'd, they'd have to put their towels on their legs to keep somewhat warm. And there were a couple of leaks in the ceiling there in the roof of it. And uh, and every once in a while, they'd have to run out and, and uh, mop up some leaks <laughs> that were coming down. So Holt Arena has uh, has gone through many different phases. So to hear that it's warm, we'll, we'll actually live with that. Well, and I, Idaho State University did announce uh, recently that uh, there's going to be some renovations that yeah. are going to take place at Holt Arena as well. So I'm excited to see what that looks like. I always joke, Lance, because you do. You have to climb up like, you know, 30, 40 sets of stairs to get to the to the broadcast booth. I always joke that, you know what? If I keel over and die from from making the long trek up these stairs, at least I'm not too far away from heaven. I'm pretty I'm pretty no, darn that's close. That's right. That's right. I mean, you pretty much need a mountain goat and a sherpa, you know, <laughs> to get up there. And then and then you have to stop halfway to for about an hour to let your lungs reacclimate, you know, to the uh, to the elevation, and then you can finish off the last little bit. Yeah, you know, all they need to do is put a an elevator in. I hope that's part of their renovations. Yes. Hopefully they put an elevator in that just goes up that backside. You know, you could do it from out in kind of the opening entrance way, you know, and go up, up to those booths. That would, uh, that would be a nice thing. You have to assume that they have to do some stuff to be ADA compliant, right? Americans with disabilities act. Yeah. Yeah. I would imagine they have to, because obviously at this point that has not, you know, been an option maybe for a, for a broadcaster or a statistician who, uh, uh, you know, is wheelchair bound or, uh, you know, might have another disability. So um, anyway, yeah. yeah. Well, uh, this is the Holt Arena podcast on Idaho Sports. Like, no, we're joking, of course. <laughs> Let's let's get into it. Before we get into football and everything going on at Holt Arena, 
Uh, let, let's talk about state cross country from last week because Lance, we knew coming in East Idaho just always seems to clean house and dominate. And um, there, there was no shortage of championship team performances and individual performances again, yeah. coming from the East. Yeah. Um, East is really strong in cross country. Let's face it. The East is strong in every sport. Uh, uh, you know, Baseball sometimes not quite as much, um, just because there's a little bit more of a warm season for for those out in the western part of the state. But but uh, cross country has just typically been dominated by southeast. I I really do think the elevation plays a part in that. Where uh, throughout the season, uh, the runners in the east have uh, more difficulties in terms of elevation and air and things like that. So when they when they go over to to Boise and and Eagle Island Park. Um, it's, it's like, a, it's not a walk in the park. It's still a difficult race, but it's, they're used to it. And those Boise runners maybe aren't. Yeah. You know, when you get the lower rate, lower elevation, Boise is only about 2,400 feet elevation, at least to the airport. And the airport's one of the higher parts of the Valley there. <laughs> and so, you know, some of the Valley is, is uh, certainly lower than that. <laughs> and, you know, you got the kids here in East Idaho running about 4,400 feet elevation and you know some of their meets are pretty high too you know you get a lot of these kids that go up to the meet in harriman state park which is up in in the island park area you know and they're running at at seven thousand feet elevation you know and stuff so it's uh you, you know I, I i do think you're correct there i think there's there's uh something that's advantageous about training in the higher elevations yep so let's kind of run down the the individuals and teams that did well from east idaho 5a boys individual titleist was idaho falls sophomore luke athy he was kind of the favorite going in he he has not lost a race this year i think he might do one or two more like northwest region old type competitions but luke yeah. athy uh, finishes his uh, idaho high school season undefeated which is impressive yeah yeah it does it does an awesome job and of course that whole group brett hill uh, the coach of Sugar Salem takes a whole group down to, uh, I, I can't remember if it's Reebok or who sponsors it, but it's down out of the Bakersfield area in California that they'll head here shortly. Uh, uh, I've got a, a actually a junior high son that's headed up to a Western regional race here uh, in, a, in a week or so, week and a half. And so uh, <clears throat> for these kids, their high school season's over, <clears throat> but they'll get to some warmer climates and they'll continue to run. Yeah. So Luke Athey wins the 5A title with a time of 15, 19.8, uh, which is awesome. Uh, if we move now to the 4A ranks, we saw Neela Roberts, the sophomore from Skyline, uh, yeah. win the girls individual race. Uh, she won it as a freshman as well. So two for two. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, what's a, what's interesting is, is you oftentimes will see um, in, in girls cross country, also girls track. Uh, that a lot of your state champions and a lot of your state records are held by freshmen, freshmen and sophomores. Um, and, uh, you know, there's there's uh, there's reasons for that and so forth. But but that is not uncommon to see. Yeah. So she finished uh, 1753.3. She finished 28 seconds ahead of the second place finisher. So, I mean, she she kind of dominated. That was the first time she'd ever ran at Eagle Island Park as well. And uh, no problems there. Let's uh, switch to the 4A boys where congratulations to Blackfoot. The Blackfoot boys win the team title and they also boast the individual titleist in uh, Eli Gregory. Yeah. And, and I mean, I think people expected Eli to be up there, at least in the running for that as a team. Uh, <clears throat> I think if you look what people saw coming into the season, um, <clears throat> I don't think a lot of people thought Blackfoot uh, would step up and win that, but for, for them to be able to do the team title, uh, that was sensational as well. Yeah. The other keys besides Gregory taking first, of course, Matt Thomas finished third, Justin Whitehead took eighth, JT Morgan finished 11th, which, which all helped Blackfoot yeah. win that boys title. Well, and Matt Thomas, his father, Roger, of course, who's, who's the uh, vice principal down there, or principal AD, uh, <laughs> Roger was a good runner at Blackfoot, ran for Idaho State University, as did his wife. Uh, my wife was one of their teammates on cross country and track there at Idaho State University as well. So that's a running family. Uh, as long as uh, Roger has children going through the school, they're going to have some good Thomas runners down there as well. Absolutely. So, yeah, Eli Gregory is the first individual champion uh, from Blackfoot to win the state title 
since 1974 when Dave Draper brought home the individual title. And his uh, uncle is Mike Gregory, who won individual titles for Blackfoot in back-to-back years in 1972 and 73. So you were talking about the Thomas family, the Gregory family also keeping that uh, family tradition alive and well at Blackfoot. Yeah, well, and you can find that. There's a, you know, there was a book written probably about 12, t- 10, 12 years ago uh, uh, called um, – I can't remember if it was the boys of fall or whatnot, but it was written, uh, co- co-written by Brett Hill, the coach of Sugar Salem and Stuart Portella. Uh, of course, people know, you know, Stuart from Firth as, as well. They, they co-wrote a book and it talks about uh, these cross country runners and you can go back and you can find a lot of those older statistics, teams, coaches, uh, individual runners and stuff that ran uh, historically too, that really kind of helped this sport gain some traction uh, in, in Idaho. Cause you go back too far before that and you really don't find it. Uh, for the most part, you know, at least not as, as something that was considered a significant fall sport where now it is it is huge. I mean, you went to a couple events this year and those events are very well attended. I mean, you you go to this, you're like, holy cow, there's a lot of people here. Yeah. And uh, but before I get too far into uh, the next thing we're going to talk about, all, all of this great information I've got about these individuals and the lineage and the family traditions, that all came from Marlo Herford, who did a fantastic job uh, writing a recap of all of the state championship races yes. from last week. That is on the homepage at IdahoSports.com. And if you haven't read that yet, I, I highly recommend you do, because when it comes to writing about the sport of cross country, there's nobody better than Marlo Herford in the state of Idaho. Yeah. So, yeah, and we appreciate it, you know, and, uh, and these athlete, athletes appreciate it. Uh, oftentimes, you know, they they tend to slide through and a lot of people might not necessarily know who they are because it hasn't it, it hasn't traditionally been as big of a spectator event as uh, as some of the other traditional sports. And but boy, I'll tell you what, there are some fantastic athletes. And if you want to see, uh, you know, a sport that puts out a number of kids into college programs, uh, you look at cross country. There are a lot of cross country and track athletes in Idaho, more than the other sports that end up in college programs. Yes, absolutely. Uh, so we've talked about Brett Hill a couple of times, the legendary coach at Sugar Salem. Uh, the Sugar Salem boys, when their seventh consecutive 3A team title uh, came down to single digits, but they did earn the win. The girls were actually upended by Snake River. Uh, yeah. Snake River just edged past Sugar Salem, uh, sixty-seven to sixty-nine. So uh, the yeah. Diggers again did very well. Well, they they did, and the girls were the Sugar Girls were trying for their fifth consecutive. Uh, they had four consecutive going in, in, in into that, and uh, so they were trying for that fifth fifth one. Snake River had a very good team. You know, South Fremont had a good team this year. South Fremont. Uh, has not had, uh, you know, a really competitive cross country team in a lot of years. They've had some good individuals uh, over the years, but but not a super competitive team. South Fremont was very good this year, pushed Sugar inside their conference, but Sugar hadn't been pushed for a long time. In fact, it was a toss up going into the district meet of whether Sugar or South was going to be able to win that. And of course, if you win that, you, you're it's more advantageous for your state because you automatically get a take. You're your top seven, you know, to you, if you win your district. So, um, yeah, Brett, Brett Hill, uh, of course, Brett and I go back a long way. Brett and I, my mother and his father went to high school together in Malad. Brett and I went to high school together in Malad. His children and my children went to high school together, but up here at Sugar. And so Brett and I have been great friends from the time we were just youngsters. And, uh, uh, he was just a little bit older than me, graduated from high school with my sister. And, and Brett is, um, he's been one of my heroes for many, many, many years. So between cross country and track and field, Brett Hill now has 49 state championships. Yep. And he passed, of course, his legendary coach, Terry Jones. <laughs> he did all those down in Malad. <laughs> they did so many down in Malad. And, and Brett's just been fantastic. He's probably the best motivator I've ever seen at the high school level. Uh, and, uh, you know, you know, sometime we need to put kind of a seminar together, I, I think, where we're coaches can hear Brett Hill kind of talk about uh, the method that he uses uh, to bring out the competition that he does. That would be great uh, when we get into the spring, maybe Lance, yeah, the, I think so. a, little, a little lighter. Yeah. Let's yep, do it. I think so. Let's do it. Uh, two, two a uh, both champs come from district six uh, on the girls side. Salmon finally toppled the, the dynasty that is soda Springs. Yeah. Um, congratulations to, to salmon. Uh, 62 to 66, they get the win there. Um, 
Soda Springs top five runners finished in the top 30, but it came down to Salmon having four medalists in yeah. Abby Williams, Sarah Deshane, Brylin Bills, and Sedona Cannon. Um, they all finished uh, in the top 20. So that's what yeah. won it for salmon. Yeah, yeah. Sa- salmon is salmon is tough, and a lot of people, if you're if you're going online, you're looking at scores and things like that. I understand the lower score is the better score, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, yes. and, uh, <laughs> that, uh, that tends to be the thing. Sometimes that people miss is is they look and say, "Well, wait a minute, they didn't score as many points as the other." It's kind of like golf; it's the lower score uh, that. Uh, uh, that is the better <laughs> right uh, that's one of the first things they teach you in broadcasting school is when you're calling a game right you always say the bigger score first in football right yeah. it's 21 to 7 it's not 7 yeah. to 21 but, but right. then in cross country you have to flip it and so it does sound a little weird coming out of my yeah, mouth right. but <laughs> you're right. right um and then north fremont boys uh defeat salmon i i sam was kind of the favorite coming in but north fremont snuck past him and won uh 60 to 64 very impressive for the huskies yeah, yeah, and if Salmon's not winning it, they're at least going to have uh, one of the, if not the top runners every single year. They're always a good program. North Freeman, I was really proud. That's a program that kind of built from not really having any runners uh, coming out to have really built into a good, solid program now uh, that is getting out and competing, and not just in cross country, but that translates over to their track and field in the spring as well. Absolutely. Corbin Johnston took third. Zach Johnston was fourth. Max Palmer took seventh. Eric Anderson, 18th for North Fremont as they win the 2A cross country championship. So uh, to summarize, East Idaho continues to dominate in cross country, especially at the smaller levels. Yes. Uh, Let's talk about another dominating performance as we uh, transition to uh, volleyball. Let's talk about uh, Sugar Salem. We we kind of knew coming in into the three A state tournament that they were the favorites, and uh, they win their third consecutive title, fifth in the last six years. They sweep Parma three nothing in the championship. Uh, yeah, didn't lose an individual game in the state, right. in the state tournament. Yeah, uh, Katie um, Katie Miller had fifteen kills, twelve digs, and a block in the championship. I mean this this team was so loaded, Lance. Oh, it was. It, <laughs> It was an unbelievable team. You know, the, the, the only unfortunate thing is that we didn't get to see uh, Skyview and uh, and Sugar play each other this year. That would have been a really special matchup. Uh, they did have a couple of opponents in common uh, by the time the state tournament was done and, and stuff with Madison, for example. But but um, uh, Sugar was a, was a very good team. Cammy Dodson, <clears throat> just an absolutely special individual, special coach. Um, she she has that perfect mix of of accountability and love, you know, with, with her athletes. If you ever have a chance to see her in action, uh, she is one of those kinds of coaches, and she's a she's a special individual, and and has put together a, a program, not just a team, but a program. Uh, absolutely, uh, they they are the uh, crown jewel of volleyball in the state, maybe rivaled only by Skyview. Um, Okay, let's talk about, you mentioned Madison. Uh, the yeah. Bobcats did great at the 5A state tournament, came all the way through to get to the championship against Skyview, uh, where where they fell. But for Madison, this was a great run. It was. In fact, a run that really a lot of people didn't see, including myself. You know, uh, you, you know there, there, there is always some unknowns as you go into the state tournament, you know. Uh, but uh, I had had a chance to see Madison play this year. Um, I felt like they were very worthy of being in the state tournament. I... I did not see them being able to go to the state championship game. So for them to do that, that was that was fantastic. And how about uh, Madison played Skyview in the undefeated semifinal Saturday morning and lost and then came back around to play him again in the championship. In that undefeated semifinal, they actually won a set. That's right. So they lost three to one. That was the first and last time that Skyview lost a set to an Idaho opponent this year. Yeah. So. Yep. Yep. And, uh, you know, Madison, M- Madison improved throughout the year as well. I think it's fair to say that, that in coaching says about a lot of teams, but I, I think Madison was was quite a bit different at the end of the year than they were at the first. Absolutely. And then finally, last shout out goes to Bonneville, yeah. who uh, also a uh, runner up at the 4A level. Uh, they, they played Twin Falls in, in an epic five set championship. Yeah, match. that's Felt, right. Fell just short three to two. The scores were 22, 25, 25, 23, 17, 25, 25, 20, 15, 10. So Bonneville held leads of one, nothing and two to one, but couldn't close out Twin Falls. It's the first state title in volleyball um, program history at Twin Falls High as well. So. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I, and I think, uh, you know, for Bonneville, if you go if you go back historically, 
uh, year in, year out, Bonneville's had a great volleyball program. You know, they, they've won it a number of times. They've been very, very good. Um, and uh, but Tw- Twin Falls was tough all year long. They're that team that I just kept looking at and saying, wow, these guys are making a splash. And for a school that's been around as long as Twin Falls High School has, I mean, for the Bruins uh, to be stepping up and, and doing what they did, you would have expected that over a, a lot of years. But right now is where that's hitting its peak. Uh, because Twin Falls won the state volleyball championship in the week prior. They won the girls soccer state championship. I can't wait till all these athletes get together on the basketball court. That's going to be fun to watch. Yeah, 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 it is. And that's, and that's, you know, that's, what's fun is you see a lot of, of athletes that are, that are multiple multi-sport athletes, you know, here at the high school level, you occasionally see it at the college level, not a lot, but, uh, but at the uh, high school level, you see it quite a bit, the smaller the school, the more crossover you tend to see with that. Um, uh, just because the athletes are all needed, you don't really have people that specialize, you know, uh, at least not as much. And, and so it, it is fun. It's fun to see how their games translate over, uh, from one sport to another. Yeah, for sure. So, uh, volleyball in the books, uh, cross country in the books, state swimming is taking place this week over in Boise. We'll talk a, a little bit about that next week. Um, but let's let's move into football, Lance. And I figure we'll just start at five A and, and kind of work our way down. We'll we'll kind of recap what happened, uh, look at the brackets, preview the quarterfinal matchups, all that good stuff. Sound good? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> right, Sounds we're excited. Good. So let's okay. So five A Madison had to go on the road to play Meridian. They lose forty seven to twenty eight. This was actually kind of a back and forth game until the second half when Meridian finally pulled away. But for Madison, I thought it was an impressive showing. Yeah, well, and and I think for Madison to make it to the playoffs this year uh, was something that most people didn't see. I didn't see that coming. Uh, Madison went in in as a three seed. Of course, we talked about Meridian last week. I picked Meridian to win that game. I thought they would. Their quarterback now was back in the lineup, uh, and Meridian's a different team like that. So their four seed was really not indicative of, uh, of how good they were. I agree with that. Uh, that's going to be a fantastic matchup. Meridian taking on Mountain View uh, as we pull up the 5A bracket. So again, if you're watching the video of this on the uh, IdahoSports.com YouTube channel or Facebook page, you'll see that we're putting the brackets up on the screen. You can kind of follow along. Um, if you are listening to the audio only at IdahoSports.com or wherever you download your podcasts, you can still follow along. Just go to IdahoSports.com on the homepage. We have all the brackets there and you can follow along that way. So when we look at the quarterfinal matchups here, the game we're going to hone in on is Rigby, of course. They had the first round by, and now they're playing a capital team that went up to Lewiston and, and just demolished the Bengals. Uh, this is a capital team that uh, is the feel-good story of the postseason. Their their longtime coach, Todd Simmons, announced that he's retiring at the end of the season, so they're the quote-unquote team of destiny. Not that Rigby cares about that necessarily. I, I like Rigby in this matchup, especially coming off a of bye. Yeah, you know, Rigby, and, and, and I think Rigby's going to have a little extra motivation, especially after such a bad final regular season game uh, that they played getting beat by Madison there. Uh, however, Capital, boy, they're not a team you can rest on. You know, Cap- Capital, and again, they're another one of those teams that we talked about last week um, that's 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 better than um, than really what a lot of people think they are. And, and uh, I pick Rigby to win this game, but it would not surprise me if Capital stepped up and won it. Capital had nine sacks against Lewiston last week. Obviously, Rigby's offensive line is very good, and Tiger Adolfo is dangerous, especially when he gets outside the pocket. But maybe that Lewiston pass rush can keep him immobile, which makes uh, Rigby a little easier to beat. But um, yeah, it does. I actually have that game tomorrow, uh, and so you know, I, I'm, I'm really excited to uh, to see that game. Last time I had Rigby in the playoffs. Uh, was when they hosted Eagle uh, a couple years ago. And um, I, I'm really excited for this matchup. I think this this might be the matchup of the weekend for 5A. Yeah, and that's saying something because you have uh, Highland going to Rocky Mountain. You've of course, got yeah. Meridian Mountain View. I, I think all the matchups are pretty good and pretty even. I wouldn't be surprised if anybody won or lost truly, but I'll, I'll go Rigby in this game, and that's going to be to, uh, Friday night, 7 o'clock in Rigby on IdahoSports.com. If you're curious about which games we're covering, which games we aren't, we got to about 85% of the quarterfinal games that are on the broadcast schedule. There's just, we don't have enough, we don't have enough sets of broadcast equipment to go cover everything. That's the biggest problem with the quarterfinals. Well, and we don't have enough broadcasters that uh, that can travel that many miles away from their parole officers, and you know, in, in, in order to cover some of the games that we need, you know, so we have 
to stay local. <laughs> yeah, we got to get not permission. true, guys. Not true. Got to get permission to leave the county. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Let's. So, so if you if you want to see which games we're covering. Click on the game streams tab on the homepage at idahosports.com. You'll see the whole broadcast schedule for Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Uh, if we move to the 4A bracket, uh, let's start with um, let, let's start with Shelley since they're kind of at the top. They had a nice win over Preston, 36 to 13. We talked about Shelley kind of backed into the postseason, right? They they were on a bit of a slide, but all it's, all it can take sometimes is one game to get it turned around. Yeah, it can. And Preston was a really inconsistent team this year, just very inconsistent. I mean, we we see them, you know, I mean, they started out with a loss to Shelley to start the season, but we see them, uh, you know, step up and beat uh, what I really felt was a good Blackfoot team this year, at least a very talented Blackfoot team this year, and then go up and get shellacked by Sugar Salem the next week. Uh, you see, they just kind of took a shellacking here, 36-13 last week's Shelley, and and, um, you, you know, I don't know if, if that was Shelley playing as good as a 36 to 13 score or if Preston playing as bad as a 36 to 13 score. Uh, but Shelley did what it took to win. Uh, I don't have Shelley winning this week. I believe Sandpoint wins this game. Uh, but again, Shelley's a good enough team that uh, uh, they could give Sandpoint a run, if not step up and win it. Yeah, Shelly got back to what they they do best. I, I call them the Russian russets because they love to run the football. Uh, yeah. Maybe maybe the running russets is better than the Russian. Oh, R U S H I N G. I thought you were talking like yeah. R U S S I A. You know? No, 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 uh, no, Vladimir Putin there. Uh, <laughs> they did. They 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 got back to the ground game. Uh, yeah. Caden Kidman scored three times on the ground. Riker Klinger had two touchdowns on the ground. So you talk about five touchdowns. That's pretty much all the scoring came via the ground. Now, I agree. If we look at the bracket, uh, that's five. If we look at the bracket, they've got to travel to Sandpoint, the number one overall seed. Uh, that is a, a long trip north for Shelley. And with the home field event, I, I've said since the start of the season, Sandpoint was kind of my overall favorite in 4A, and I'm continuing to hold that line. Um, this will be a tough one for Shelley. I agree to go up north, but we'll yeah. see what happens. We'll see. Uh, let's talk about Blackfoot. Blackfoot took on Middleton and won 52 to 24. Now, Middleton was without their starting quarterback, Kai McClure, but I mean, Blackfoot still just dominated in the, in this game. This is another team that we've, we've had a hard time figuring out this year, Lance. What do you yeah. make of this? Well, and, and, and I think Blackfoot, if Blackfoot plays to their talent level, Blackfoot could not only win this game, but could potentially step up and beat Sandpoint if they meet if they meet in the next level or in the next round. And I'm I'm just saying if they play to their talent level. Um, the thing, one of the things that I think has been so good about Sandpoint is is Sandpoint not only plays to their uh, talent level, but they are always prepared, very well prepared. And and oftentimes the team that wins is the team that plays to the level of their preparation more so than the level of their talent. And uh, but if Blackfoot plays to the level of their of their talent, boy, they they are a very tough team. I have them winning this game over Napa this week. In fact, I have them winning it fairly handily. Okay, uh, it was nice to see Blackfoot. It was nice to see somebody else besides Javante King step up. Now King played well last week. Certainly, yeah. uh, he had ten catches for 197 yards. But Deegan Hale, he's kind of the X factor to me because if he can make plays, then that's two guys you have to worry about on the perimeter. Deegan Hale had three touchdown passes uh, or touchdown receptions, and then he also picked off two passes in the secondary. So. To me, yeah. he's kind of the X factor. He played really well. I will say, Lance, I don't trust Blackfoot. I just have a feeling about this. And so when we look at this bracket, and yes, they're playing a 13 seed Nampa, but this is a Nampa team that has now uh, defeated Middleton and Emmett, and they're playing with a lot of uh, momentum. They're, they're on they a little bit of a winning streak. and They are. Not, not only beat Emmett, but they beat an Emmett te team that shut out Bishop Kelly earlier in the season. Right. And and so yeah, I mean I mean there's no question that that Nampa uh, has that ability, and I think Nampa is a better team now than they were at the first of the year. But I just I just think Blackfoot, if they play to the level of their talent, that Blackfoot wins this game handily. But 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 again, I mean you say you don't trust Blackfoot. I there's a little bit of that in me too, you know. Meaning, I, not not quite sure I'd put money in Vegas on that game. Yeah, I use that as a term a lot, and just so people know, I don't gamble on games ever right <laughs> with my kids hey whoever wins this game you go in the 
kitchen and make the shakes tonight. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I do a little bit of that, but, but, but uh, I always just use that as an example. Cause it's, it's something that people understand, you know, and, and right. I, uh, I, I think if there was a spread on this game, you'd probably have, have Blackfoot by about probably a minus 12 uh, at this point. Uh, being wow. favored in that, but uh, that's about what I would put it at. But um, you never know. That is so. That is a game Friday night in Blackfoot. I'm calling it. I'm calling Nampa with the with the win. And if I'm wrong, I will gladly come back next week and wear it for all the Blackfoot fans. I just don't trust them yet. So, yeah. well, whenever, that, you know, teams have to earn trust, and they haven't earned full trust yet this year for sure. Yes. Another team that hasn't quite earned my trust is Skyline because I was at this game, Lance, in Holt Arena on Friday night. Skyline taking on Lakeland, uh, forty-two to twenty-one. They get the win. That's a deceptive final score, though, because uh, it, it they trailed the entire first half. They trailed into the third quarter, and it was two turnovers followed by an explosion, really, in the final ten minutes that won this game for Skyline. But they advance and a very favorable matchup, I think, with yeah. Valley View, who shocked undefeated Minico in the first. Yeah, round. yeah, that was really the shock of the first round uh, at pretty much any level. Uh, I think that was the biggest of the shocks, Valley View over Minico. Um, you know, I I really expected for the most part a, a Minico and Sandpoint matchup eventually in the state championship game. Um, but but Skyline, yeah, Skyline's another one of those teams. I've had them a couple different times this year, and and they've just been very inconsistent. Um, you know, as I, as I've had a chance to watch them. And again, they're another one of those teams that are, are, are they going to play up to the level of their talent? Cause if they do, they've got quite a bit of talent on that team. And, and of course they go into the state playoffs with that, with that, uh, little bit of a mental edge, you know, having won it last year and, and wanting to get back and, and, uh, and defend that again this year. But yeah, they, they, uh, they did not play that great of game against Lakeland. And I do not feel that Lakeland is a very good team. And uh, for La- Lakeland to have hung with Skyline like that, um, I uh, I was pretty surprised. And so uh, I picked Skyline this game, but it's it's again it's it's not a game I'd probably put much money on. Yeah, I I, I think I, I'm going with Skyline almost by default because I just I don't I don't think Valley View is they're they're a team that's they're they're out over their skis I think at this point. Yeah. Um, yeah. But Scott, but Lachlan Hackey, you know, has to be more consistent if Skyline wants to um, get back to the championship game. He he turned the ball over way too many times against Lakeland, and you can tell that this team kind of runs through Kenyon Sadiq when when yeah. they when they need a play. Skyline was down fourteen uh, to six, and it was fourth and goal at the one. They put Sadiq in as, as the quarterback and just said, "Stretch over the goal line, big fella," and yeah. and he also caught three touchdown passes. If you can stop Sadiq, I'll take my chances with a Bron Severio. I'll, I'll take my chances with that. Sadiq's yeah, the yeah. guy you got to worry about. And if you can stop Sadiq, I think you stop Skyline. Well, Sadiq's the next level uh, talented receiver. You know, he's a guy that can play uh, on Saturdays after his high school career is over. And, and, uh, and so, uh, you, you know, when it comes to Sadiq, um, you, you can you can live and die uh, w- with him, but he's a player. I think if you're targeting him most, you're going to be living. And uh, but but again, you got to curb the turnovers. Curn- turnovers are just absolutely destructive. Yeah, this will be a Saturday night game inside Holt Arena, seven o'clock, and I will be on the call for that game on IdahoSports.com. So second second week in a row, I'll get to uh, see Skyline in action. Uh, another team I got to see in action was Bonneville. Let's give a quick shout out to the bees. I mean, they were the number 15 seed. They came in to play number two Pocatello in Holt arena, 24 to six. They lose, but I'll tell you, Lance, they had a great strategy. They came in basically saying, we're going to control the clock and control the ball. Keep that Pocatello offense off the field. And, you know, we'll, we'll take our chances late in the game, making some big plays. And they did. They were driving with four minutes to play down 17 to six inside Pocatello's 20 yard line. Now if they score there, it's a one possession game. They still have their timeouts too, but the key play was crew Hales intercepted a pass at the goal line for Pocatello and took it back a hundred yards for a touchdown. And, and at that point, the game was pretty much over 24, six, but I was very impressed with Bonneville might be the best defense uh, I've seen this year in terms of scheme and players. Well, and we know Bonneville is headed in a, in a northward direction, you know, which is, of course, the only place they could head from last year. I guess they could have stayed even, 
Uh, but this is a team that improved a lot. And Bonneville proved that, that they're headed in the right direction. And I think you take everything that happened, particularly the last half of the season, and you use that to build on going into next year. They've got the right guy in charge, Kevin Kempf, doing a great job. Yeah, I believe so, too. With that program. Uh, 3A bracket. Let's talk about South Fremont. This is another one of those teams I don't trust yet, Lance. South Fremont. I, I called Kellogg with the win on the road. Um, South Fremont did hold on to win 35 to 30. So I will own that. Congratulations to South Fremont. I think the key in that game was Kellogg got down by two scores early and then matched South Fremont score for score the rest of the way. And they could never make up that deficit. So finally, South Fremont started a game strong. They've been kind of slow starting at times this year. Yeah, they have. Uh, and you know, and for, for South Fremont, that's a big deal. I mean, when they played sugar in their final regular season matchup, uh, well, I guess they had they played Teton after, but when they played their rival Sugar, uh, they just got down early, and 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 it changes your game plan. You know, now you've got to do things to to crawl out of a hole. You know, and which you know changes up, of course, what you want to do as a you know as a coach and as a program. But South Fremont, when South Fremont plays good, South Fremont's very competitive. I uh, I believe Homedell will win this game. Uh, but, but I think, uh, I think South can actually step up and can, can, and can give them a run, but, but yeah, the game with Kellogg, Kellogg got down and then they just kind of held serve. Everybody held serve from there on out. Um, but you know, South Fremont again, they're into that next round of the, of the playoffs. And, and, uh, I remember they went to the semis last year, which is the farthest they'd ever gone in the state playoffs. And, you know, they're looking at the very least to try to get back there this year. Yeah, it's just, and I don't know, uh, I, I haven't seen the team in person and I haven't seen enough film to know, but it's it seems different. Cayman Peebles last year threw for 2,528 yards. I think that was the high total in the entire state. In this game against Kellogg, he threw for 121 yards. Just something yeah. isn't adding up there. And so, I mean, as long as they're winning, it's fine, but I don't yeah. know. Well, it's different. He's a good running quarterback. He's a tremendous athlete, good basketball player as well. He's, he's thick on the lower body, so he can, uh, you know, he can take hits. He can run through, uh, you know, some people at times. But, but I think they've got to get some more consistent passing out of him when he throws the ball. Uh, that's a place he really struggled against Sugar. Um, and, and I think if they want to beat a Homedale team, they certainly cannot be one-dimensional on the field and beat Homedale. Uh, yeah. you, you, you've got to be able to perform from many different uh, aspects and angles, and, and uh, the Peebles is going to have to have his passing game going. Yeah, that'll be a game Saturday, 1 o'clock in Homedale. Uh, I think the ride ends here for South Fremont. Homedale is just so talented. And again, if I'm wrong next week, I'll gladly own it. But I, yeah. I'm leaning Homedale here. Okay, Lance, the game we're going to be on the call for Thursday night inside Holt Arena, 7 o'clock, 5th seed Marsh Valley, 4th seed Sugar Salem. Uh, these teams both had first-round buys. This is a rematch from a game we saw earlier this year that uh, Sugar won 28-14. to 14. How do you think the rematch goes? You know, uh, again, these are teams that know each other. And, and you know, you hear you hear that thing of, well, these teams know each other so well, it's always going to be a close game. Well, if they know each other so well, then things should be sixes. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I've, I've always, always felt that way. I have Sugar Pick to win this game. Uh, it, it doesn't doesn't necessarily mean they will. One thing that you got to that you run into with Marsh Valley, because Marsh Valley is one of the smaller 3A schools in the state, is um, – you know, most of the people that, that Sugar face, because outside of conference, most of the teams they play are bigger schools, uh, 4A division schools. So Sugar ends up defending the spread a lot. You know, you get in against a Marsh Valley team that's a little bit undersized. You end up, uh, you know, having to defend that that wing T, uh, sometimes a double wing. Uh, and, and and that poses some challenges. I've always said it's uh, anytime a, a team has to play somebody that runs the wing T, you end, what you end up with is kind of like a school – uh, you know, in college, when you have to play one of the military schools and you have to to defend against that triple option, you know, and it sometimes takes you a half of that game to get your par bearing set of how to defend that, you know, and and I and I, I think that's what what happens here. I think Sugar Salem wins this game, but I think uh, I think it might be closer than the tw than the twenty eight fourteen score um, that we saw last time. I mean, almost every game Marsh Valley's been in this year has been either a close win or a close loss. They seem to yeah. keep it pretty close to the best. Yeah, yeah, they do. They do. They played a really tough schedule this year as well. Multiple defending state champions from both Utah and yeah. Idaho on their yeah. schedule. Yeah. Uh, 
I, I think athlete for athlete, Marsh Valley matches up with Sugar Salem pretty well. They've got good athletes. The problem is, is the consistency and Sugar has done this before for Marsh Valley. This yeah. is still kind of new territory. I know they won state basketball and state baseball, and some of those kids play football. But again, in football, it's it's a little different. And I don't know. They, just, they haven't gone through it yet. So I, it's going to be a, a close, uh, entertaining game. So. Yeah, yeah, I, I think it is too. I think one of the differences too is the size of the lines. Uh, Sugar is a bit bigger on their lines uh, than Marsh Valley is. Uh, doesn't tend to play quite as big a role in quarters one and two, but it tends to play a big role in three and four. Uh, so we'll we'll see. Yeah, this game will be played in Holt Arena Thursday night. Ironically enough, Sugar Salem is the higher seeded team. They actually have to travel further to get to Holt Arena <laughs> than Marsh Valley does. But well, with as chilly a weather as it's been, I don't think anybody's minding too much. That's right. Uh, they'll they'll gladly take that trade off. Yeah. Uh, the two A bracket. Uh, let's take a look at uh, Firth had had a, a nice win over Aberdeen, forty three to eight in Holt Arena last week. Again, though, this was a game that was tight for a half and really even into the third quarter, and then Firth kind of exploded to put the game away. Firth now advances. How about this? They get the number three seed overall, even though they had to play a first round game because they reseed everybody for the quarterfinals. They've got to play a Declo team that is not a walk in the park. I'm actually kind of nervous for Firth in this matchup. No, no yes, I, I I am, and that should be a very good first round matchup. There's some, there is some excellent first round matchups right here. Well, I guess it's ultimately quarterfinal rounds, but but uh, I, I really think there's only one game that I look at here and say that's kind of a guarantee, and that's the West Side Grangeville game. Yeah. Uh, other than that. I mean, I think it's going to be it's going to be a tough game for Firth. It's going to be a tough game for North Fremont. It's going to be a tough game for Bear Lake. You know, another East Idaho team, obviously District Five, not District Six. But but um, yeah, I, I looked at this matchup, and and uh, Firth has some challenges here. I think Firth can't get off to a slow start because Declo is a team that loves to ball control, especially with the running game of uh, Derek Matthews. So if uh, yeah. Declo gets out to a lead, might be tough for Firth to come back. Um, so I think Firth has to be a little more consistent to start. It's going to be a strength on strength, right? Firth's strength is their defensive line. Declo's strength is running the ball, and we'll see yeah, which side wins out. Yeah, and I think Firth has to play. Another thing is you've got to play all four quarters. All four quarters, you've got to have a, a good quarter. Uh, in fact, as, as I look at their potential road to a state championship, or at least to the state championship game, I think that stays true the whole the whole place, the whole time. Well, yeah, we talk about it uh, in the North Fremont game. A really bad fourth quarter cost them, cost them That's that right. win, right? That's right. So, uh, I mean, you've 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 got to play four good quarters. Absolutely. Well, speaking of North Fremont, they had a first round by. They're the number two seed overall. This this is no walk in the park either. They got to play Melba, the number seven seed. This is a tough matchup, also. It is. Well, and it's a rematch from earlier on in the season. Yeah, and that was a tight game. That was at Melba. That was a tough game. Uh, I'll be on the call for this game uh, with Lauren Jensen on Saturday. Uh, but this is a uh, th this is a tough matchup. <laughs> yeah. There's no question about it. I'm taking North Fremont in this matchup, just like I'm taking Firth in the matchup against Declo. But uh, like you said, it's it's not a walk in the park. Yeah, they uh, played back in September, and North Fremont won that game, 48 to 38. So. Yeah. Both of these teams like to run the football, right? Melba yep. runs that kind of wing T. Uh, North Fremont, of course, runs the triple option. Yep. So whichever team can can get out to a lead, I think, has the upper hand in this battle. I'm with you, though. I will lean Firth. I will lean North Fremont. But again, if, if either of those teams fell, it wouldn't surprise me because this, to me, might be the most balanced field among the eight teams that are playing, right? There's only yep. one layup. Yep, so. yep. yep. Yeah, let's talk about the one. Three let's words. Talk, let's talk about the one A D one rank. It's gotten, and it's helping me climb that uh, ladder faster than you can say. That, is, oh shoot! Is that your oh, computer? I, reply all. I don't There's think so. Content, I don't think it's mine. Life. Ping me. We have an ad playing somewhere on our web browser. It's gone now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Anyways, we'll see if that made the cut. Somebody just got a free advertisement. <laughs> um, okay. <laughs> Now that we're refocused here, one eight D one bracket, um, nothing to report from the first round. We see Butte County as the number three seed. They will take on the six seed notice in a battle of the pirates. This will be a Saturday game inside Holt arena. 
at four o'clock on idahosports.com. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is, I like Butte County in this matchup, and I, I like them pretty convincingly. Notice is a team that hasn't, they got to prove it to me first. They really haven't done that on the statewide level. No, and I, I, I honestly, I think your state championship matchup is going to be Butte County and Raft River. I think that is going to be the matchup there. Uh, I think Oakley also wins first round. I, I think Lapway beats Prairie. Wow. And, uh, but, uh, but, uh, but I think Raft River uh, and Butte County is, is where it's going to end up being. I could be uh, wrong, but I think that's it. Okay. Well, B- Butte County, I think a big edge for them over a lot of the teams they're going to play and, uh, unt- until the championship possibly is their depth. They have so many yeah. players this year. You know, I was talking to Logan Green, who's a broadcaster for us, and he did he when Dietrich played Butte County earlier this year in Arco, he was on the call for that game. And he goes, I looked over at Butte County's sideline and it looked like a two A program, honestly, with as many kids as they had on the sideline. So Yeah, well, well, I mean, and, and when you look back, I mean it's only been about a decade since they went down. You know, they were they were a solid two A for a right. lot of years. And uh, so they, you know, as they jump down to the 1AD1 level, they're one of your bigger 1AD1s in the state. They're kind of like a Grace High School is, you know, that's, that's, uh, that's, you know, good size. Right. Let's wrap up with the 1AD2 ranks. The only thing to talk about from District 6 is Water Springs. We talked about having to go to Castle Ford in a rematch of a game from earlier in the regular season, losing 70 to nothing. That's just, they ran into a buzzsaw, but uh, for water Springs, you know, they won the conference last year, lost some very talented players. And now they're going to have to rebuild again next year as they lose some more talented players. I did. And they had some size challenges this year, uh, particularly in their secondary that, you know, you, it changes from year to year. That's one thing with, with high school is, is you've, um, you know, you kind of you kind of have to go with the hand you've been dealt, and then it's a uh, that's even more that shines even more uh, at a smaller school level, and then even more at a private school, uh, where you know occasionally you have kids that will opt out and and go to a public school or vice versa, and so you know those those hands change fairly quickly. Yeah, the eight man game it is tough. You you have to constantly adjust, and uh, depth is so important. Just to, just look at what happened to North Gem, right? They yeah. lost they lost two starters uh, in that playoff loss to Camas County, and and I mean a team that I picked to win the state title goes out in the first round. So yeah, yeah, very yeah North Gem looked very good this year. You know, North Gem looked very good this year, but yeah, it happens. I mean, I mean that was kind of the matchup that was equivalent to the Minico game, you know, for four A where. Uh, you know, a team that had so much high hopes going in was just unable to uh, to carry that on. Yeah. So, all right, Lance, uh, I feel pretty good about uh, the football teams that will be competing this weekend. Uh, I, I I feel pretty good about that. We're going to be talking next week about at least some of these teams getting ready for semifinal matches. What do yeah, you think? yeah, I, I I absolutely think so too. I think. Uh, um, uh, you know, you know, I I think really an interesting side of the bracket is, is I, I believe both Homedale and Sugar win this week, uh, which makes you know fourth year in a row for a state matchup. If that was to happen, of course, the previous three happened in the state championship game. This one would uh, would be in the semis, but but it's uh, it, it, I mean you don't you don't really want to look ahead, but it is a potentially very good matchup if so. Yeah, that and that would be we could spend a whole podcast talking about just that matchup in particular if we got there next week. Yeah, Yeah. Yeah, a lot of history in that matchup. Yes, for sure. All right. Well, first, they got to get past Marsh Valley. I'll see you in a couple hours at Holt Arena, Lance, as we uh, are on the call for that. So we'll do that. Looking forward to it. Yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun. Again, and to, to check all the games that we're broadcasting this weekend, just go to the Game Streams tab on the homepage at idahosports.com. That'll do it for this edition of the East Idaho PrepCast, brought to you by Pure Adrenaline Motorsports, your source for pulse-pounding adrenaline sports apparel and accessories that ensure you have what you need to unleash your inner beast. For Lance Taylor, I'm Brandon Bainey. Enjoy the games this weekend, everybody. We'll see you back here next time on idahosports.com.